Hi, welcome back guys. Today we'll continue on with our discussion of the head. We'll go through um, the scalp, the parotid gland, um, the orbit, the eye, as well as a lot of clinical conditions. We'll start with a few um, pathological implications. Squamous cell carcinoma of the lip is a cancer of the lip that most frequently involves the lower lip. Sun exposure that builds up over time is a major contributing factor, as is um, irritants from pipe smoking. When we talk about squamous cell carcinoma of the lip, um, the location of the lip that the cancer is on directly affects the nodes that it might spread to during metastasis. The central part of the lower lip, as well as the floor of the mouth and the tip or apex of the tongue, drain down into the submental nodes. Right? So the nodes that are just underneath um, the chin right here. The more lateral areas of the lower lip, though, drain into the submandibular nodes a little bit back further. Um, the upper lip also drains into the submandibular nodes, and then the, the upper lip has um, some drainage that goes into the preauricular and parotid nodes as well, a little bit more superiorly located. Trigeminal neuralgia um, is a sensory disorder that's um, unknown. The cause of it is unknown. There are theories that state um, it's because of some sort of an anomalous blood vessel that compresses the nerve um, or one of the roots of the trigeminal nerve. Um, there are other theories that say it's some sort of a pathological process that affects the trigeminal ganglia. Um, but whatever the cause is, trigeminal neuralgia is a sensory disorder that causes severe pain. Um, it affects the root of the trigeminal nerve, causing sudden excruciating pain um, like periods of time. We call these paroxysms. Um, a paroxysm is just this sudden like jab of lightning pain, really severe sudden pain. And these um, these little periods um, can last 15 minutes or more. And again, it's excruciating. Um, it's typically initiated or set off by touching some sort of a sensitive trigger zone. Um, looking at trigeminal neuralgia, it typically will affect um, one of the roots of the trigeminal nerve. And think of the trigeminal nerve as having like three branches, right? The, um, the first V1 um, or the Trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve five, right? Hence the V, and tri, like three branches. So the um, V1 is the ophthalmic, V2, the second is the maxillary, and then the third branch is the mandibular, right? So one, two, three. Um, trigeminal neuralgia most commonly affects the maxillary nerve, which is V2. Um, then after that is the mandibular nerve, which is three. And then um, the least frequent is the ophthalmic nerve, which is V1. Lesions of the trigeminal nerve um, result in paralysis as well as anesthesia. Um, paralysis of the muscles of mastication. Mastication is chewing. So paralysis of the muscles that are involved with chewing as well as anesthesia um, that goes over the frontal regions of the scalp, right, so the frontal bone, and then throughout the majority of the face as well. Um, if you look at the picture here, you can see the sensory distribution of the three roots of the cranial, of the trigeminal nerve. So you see V1 over um, the anterior scalp and frontal region, um, in the, the bridge of the nose, you see V2 and then V3. So the majority of the face um, is anesthetized. Also the cornea and conjunctiva um, of the eye and the mucous membranes of the nose, paranasal sinuses, the mouth and anterior regions of the tongue. Notice that um, this region here over the angle of the mandible is not anesthetized. 
Remember when we talked about the parotid gland, um, we said that the skin over the parotid gland is actually innervated by the greater auricular nerve. Um, so lesions of the trigeminal nerve are not going to anesthetize this area that's served with the greater auricular nerve, um, but the rest of the face and frontal regions of the scalp will be anesthetized. Okay, so we'll spend some time talking about the parotid gland. Um, the parotid gland is one of these salivary glands. We have three pairs of salivary glands. Um, the parotid gland happens to be the largest of the three. The parotid gland is surrounded by the parotid sheath, which is derived from the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. Um, <clears throat> on the sheath and in the gland are parotid lymph nodes, which you guys see um, in this picture down here, represented as like the little green structures. The parotid gland lies antero-inferior to the external acoustic meatus. So um, the external acoustic meatus remembers the opening into the ear. So just in front of um, and below that external acoustic meatus, so right around this region right here, um, is the parotid gland, and it lies on the parotid, the parotid bed. It's located between the ramus of the mandible, um, so the ascending region of the mandible, and the mastoid process, which is right back here. When we look at the parotid gland, it has a base and an apex. The base is related to the zygomatic arch, so this is the more superior portion that's relatively flat. Um, the apex is more downward pointing and is, um, sits just behind the angle of the mandible. So this is the apex down here, and again, it gets tucked kind of just behind that angle of the mandible. Embedded in the parotid gland um, is the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven, um, and the parotid plexus of that facial nerve. You'll see that the facial nerve um, enters in the, the posterior um, or the back of the parotid gland, and then it, it branches out as the facial nerve heads in towards the face. Um, so from superficial to deep, in the parotid gland is the facial nerve, and then deep to that is the retromandibular vein, and then deep to that is the external carotid artery. Um, so looking at these pictures, you can see the facial nerve and the way that it branches. Looking at this one down here, um, this is the main trunk of the facial nerve coming in, right? and then you can see right, we end up having temporal branch, zygomatic branches, um, the cervical branch, mandibular branch. You can also see up here. Coming in, right, and the branch is all radiating out. You can't actually see the, the retromandibular vein well. I have the vessels shown um, better behind it on another picture. The parotid duct exits um, horizontally from the anterior aspect of the parotid gland. So looking here at the anterior aspect of the parotid gland, this is the parotid duct exiting from it. Um, it goes horizontally across the masseter muscle, which you see right here. And then at the anterior edge of the masseter, it turns sharply in, right? It turns medially and punctures the cheek. Um, it goes through the buccinator muscle, and then it enters the oral cavity just opposite the second maxillary molar. Okay, so the upper jaw, um, the maxilla, just opposite the second molar. So on the, the cheek, kind of right by um, the second maxillary molar. And it enters in through the parotid papilla, like a little tiny, like little swollen area, and then there's the um, the orifice where it opens. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see the retromandibular vein, 
right, which we said was just deep to the facial nerve. Okay, so you see the parotid gland and you can see the retromandibular vein as it goes across um, the parotid gland. That's what you see right here as well. Which is a branch of the external jugular vein. So this right down here is the external jugular vein. And then you see it branches and the retromandibular um, vein passes um, deep to the parotid gland. Sensory innervation um, to the parotid gland is via the great auricular nerve, um, which comes from the cervical nerve C2 and C3. The great auricular nerve provides sensory information from the parotid sheath as well as the overlying skin. Um, and that's what I was mentioning when we were looking at the sensory innervation of the, uh, the frontal regions of the scalp and the face. And we said it was um, almost entirely via cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, except this little region here over the angle of the mandible. Um, we said that was from the great auricular nerve. Right? So this is what I was talking about. The great auricular nerve um, provides sensory information over um, that parotid sheath and this, this overlying skin that sits right over the parotid gland. And here you see the great auricular nerve. Um, so the great auricular nerve kind of comes up from the inferior regions underneath the parotid gland and comes into the parotid gland. The facial nerve was coming um, more directly at the parotid and then branching out from there. Parasympathetic stimulation of the parotid gland produces a thin, watery saliva that gets released into the oral cavity. Um, the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve, oops, cranial nerve nine, um, provides the presynaptic secretory fibers. Those presynaptic fibers go to the otic ganglion. Um, and then postsynaptic fibers travel from the otic ganglion to the parotid gland via a branch of the trigeminal nerve. Um, it's the auriculotemporal nerve. Um, the auriculotemporal nerve is a branch of the trigeminal nerve, specifically um, the third root, V3, which is the mandibular. Right? Remember, one is ocular ophthalmic. Um, or ocular, two is maxillary, and then three is mandibular. Um, sensory fibers that come from the parotid gland also pass through um, this nerve, the auriculotemporal nerve. Here, so cranial nerve nine again with the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, the otic ganglion, you see right here. And the auriculotemporal nerve is going from the otic ganglion to the parotid gland. Um, and again, that parasympathetic stimulation just causes secretion of saliva from the parotid gland. Um, you'll also notice here, this going back to, um, this is showing you the trigeminal nerve, right? One, two, and three. So you see that auriculotemporal nerve is a branch coming from the trigeminal nerve. So cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal, provides the presynaptic fibers. They synapse on the otic ganglion, and then <clears throat> from the otic ganglion, the postsynaptic fibers are actually branches of um, cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve. The parotid gland can become infected. Um, we see infection of the parotid gland and inflammation associated with the mumps virus. The mumps virus passes through the bloodstream and into the parotid gland, causing pretty severe inflammation of the gland. Um, now, when the parotid gland um, swells, it becomes really tight within that parotid sheath. And this is actually pretty 
painful. Um, the parotiditis, the swelling of the parotid gland is really painful because remember we said that um, the, the sheath is innervated by the great auricular nerve. So this great auricular nerve provides sensory input um, that we sense as pain from the area. Um, that area is, is kind of similar, perceived as a pain that's similar to the pain of a toothache. Um, and it's aggravated by mastication or chewing, just like a toothache would be. Um, one of the things that can help differentiate between um, mumps as involving the parotid gland and pain from a toothache um, is that you can actually visualize the inflammation of the parotid duct. The parotid duct remembers the duct that carries saliva from the anterior aspect of the parotid gland and then it empties into the into the, the oral cavity just opposite of the second maxillary molar. Um, the, the hole or the entry where the saliva enters into the oral cavity is referred to as the parotid papilla. And that's what you guys see right here. Okay, so the mouth is, is opened and looking just lateral or just kind of outside um, the second maxillary molar, you see this little raised bump. Um, and that's the opening of the duct. So that parotid papilla will become kind of red and angry looking when the duct is inflamed. And this is a good early sign um, that there's some mumps or just some sort of inflammation or infection that's involving the parotid gland as opposed to just a general toothache. Parotid gland disease um, in general is often associated with pain in the general area by the parotid gland. So pain in the oracle, um, the external ear, the external acoustic meatus or the, the passageway um, going into the ear, the temporal region as well as um, TMJ is the temporomandibular joint. It's a joint between the temporal bone and um, the mandible. The reason for this is the auriculotemporal nerve, the nerve that we just saw that um, we said also carries sensory fibers from the parotid gland. Um, the auriculotemporal nerve also has sensory fibers that are present in the skin that lies over the temporal fossa and the auricle. Um, the same nerve carries fibers from the parotid gland and from the skin over this whole region of the ear and the temporal region. Um, so pain signals coming from the parotid gland can be referred to the other areas that are also served by this auriculotemporal nerve. Um, here you see the auriculotemporal nerve. Remember we said that that was um, a branch of the trigeminal nerve, right? specifically V3, the mandibular branch. Um, and if you look at the temporal mandibular nerve, you can see it come, it passes up right past the external acoustic meatus, right, right over the oracle um, and up to the temporal region. So the referred pain can be felt all throughout the area that's served by this auriculotemporal nerve. Parotidectomy um, is just a removal of the parotid gland, and this is done when there's malignancy present in the gland. 80% of salivary tumors are present in the parotid gland or involve the parotid gland and require parotidectomy. Um, remember that the facial nerve or cranial nerve 7 is embedded in the parotidal parotid gland, as you see right here. This is the facial nerve, and you see the facial nerve plexus as it radiates out through the gland. Um, preserve, identifying the facial nerve and preserving the function of the facial nerve is a priority um, when removing the parotid gland. Imaging like a CT scan or an MRI is used to check the position of the nerve versus the position of the tumor. 
um, before surgery in order to plan surgery and try and preserve the function um, of the nerve. The facial nerve itself isn't visible on the CT or MRI, but the retromandibular vein is visible, and we know that the nerve is just adjacent to the retromandibular vein. So that allows for um, planning of the parotidectomy um, and planning of, of avoidance of the, um, of the facial nerve. All right, so we are finished with the parotid glands. We'll go ahead and move into the orbit and then finish up with the eye. The orbit refers to the semi-pyramidal shaped bony cavity in the facial skeleton that houses and protects the eyeball as well as the muscles, nerves, and vessels that are associated with the eyeball and the lacrimal apparatus, which is responsible for producing and distributing tears across the eye. The orbit can be um, described as having a base and an apex. The base is actually the front open area, the orbital opening um, where there's no bony structure. This is directed anterior laterally. The apex um, or the, the pointed region of the pyramid is directed posterior immediately. Um, and this is the point that's located on the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. Um, where the optic canal is located. Um, the optic canal is the, the opening or passageway that the optic nerve passes through um, as it leaves the eye and goes back to enter into um, or connect to the brain. Uh, this optic canal is just medial to the posterior orbital fissure, which we'll see in just a second. The orbit can be divided up into four walls, the lateral, medial, and then superior and inferior walls. These walls are formed by bones of the skull and face, including the frontal, sphenoid, um, and ethmoid bones, the lacrimal, zygomatic, palatine bones, and then the maxilla as well. The lateral wall of the orbit is um, the strongest and thickest wall, which makes sense because that's the wall that's the most vulnerable to trauma, right, or, or direct impact. The medial wall is the thinnest wall, um, just been described as being paper thin and almost opaque. The superior wall is referred to as the roof, and then the inferior wall, which is also pretty thin, is referred to as the floor. Here you see the orbit. Again, it's this, um, this open area that's typically occupied um, by the eye and vessels and nerves. Um, and then any extra area that's present surrounding the eye is actually filled with um, adipose tissue or fat. Um, <clears throat> this is divided up into the different sections, right? The roof um, and the floor, the lateral wall, and then the medial wall. You can also see the fissures. Um, there's an inferior orbital fissure down here and a superior orbital fissure up here. Um, just medial or just inside from the superior orbital fissure is the optic canal. Right, so this hole or passageway right there is the optic canal. Again, that's where the optic nerve passes through. There are a few other features that you guys should be able to identify in the orbit. The fossa for the lacrimal gland um, is a, an anterior lateral depression in the orbital part of the frontal bone, right? So the big frontal bone here at the front of the skull um, forms the, the, the roof um, of the orbit. And when you look at the frontal bone, the portion that's forming the orbit, on the front and lateral aspect of it, there's a little depression um, and that houses the lacrimal gland, the gland that produces lacrimation or produces tears up here in the, the superior and lateral portions of the eye. The lacrimal groove um, and fossa for the lacrimal sac is located um, on the lacrimal bone. So that's in the anterior medial portion of the lacrimal bone. 
and that houses the lacrimal sac where we actually drain um, lacrimation or tears. Right, so the tears are made up here at the lacrimal gland and then they're drained down here at the lacrimal sac. There are two orbital fissures that are present. I showed you them on the last page. Um, the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. The superior orbital fissure is present in the sphenoid bone, just lateral to the apex or the optic canal. Um, later on, we'll see, we'll look at multiple nerves that pass through. The inferior orbital fissure um, is located more inferior, and it separates the inferior and lateral walls from each other. The optic canal, again, is the passageway through the sphenoid bone, specifically the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, um, at the apex or um, point of the orbit. The optic nerve, again, passes through this optic canal as it leaves the eye and um, goes back to connect to the brain. All right, so looking at the orbit, this area up here um, is the fossa for the lacrimal gland, right? So that's the little depression in the frontal bone where the lacrimal gland sits. And you can see that looking at this picture right down here. Okay, so this is showing you the lacrimal gland where we produce lacrimation or tears. Um, looking at the, the opposite aspect here, this purple bone is showing you the lacrimal, the lacrimal bone um, and the little groove, right, or the little depression right there um, is showing you the groove for the lacrimal sac, right? And this is showing you the lacrimal, this is showing you the lacrimal sac. Okay, and then that connects to the nasal, nasal lacrimal duct where we drain the tears. So you can see the tears get produced up here in the superior lateral region of the eye. Then they drain inferiorly and medially out through the lacrimal sac. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, this right here is pointing to the fossa for the lacrimal sac. It's often referred to as the lacrimal groove. And up here you can see the fissures. Hey, so um, the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure and located just medial to the superior orbital fissure. Right here, you see the optic canal and where the optic nerve passes. And again, that's considered the apex of the orbit. Orbital fractures are possible when there's a direct blow to the eye or to the orbit. When the blow comes to the orbital rim, it usually results in fracture of the margin at one of the sutures or one of the areas where the bones come together along the margin. A blow to the eye itself can fracture the orbital walls while the margin remains intact. When this occurs, the medial and inferior walls are more prone to fracture because of the thinness of the walls, specifically the medial wall. When the medial wall is fractured, this can also involve the ethmoid sinus and the sphenoid sinus, um, whereas when the inferior wall is fractured, it can also involve the maxillary sinus. Fractures of the inferior wall can also entrap the inferior rectus muscle um, and in this case, this tends to limit the upward gaze that the patient's able to do. Um, indirect traumatic injury can displace orbital walls as well. We refer to that as a blowout fracture. Regardless of the type of fracture that's present, orbital fractures typically result in um, a decent amount of infraorbital bleeding, um, which can cause exophthalmus. Remember, we saw that last time, that's bulging of the eyes um, out of the socket due to a pressure back behind them. Um, orbital tumors are also uh, possible. Um, if the tumor occurs in the middle cranial fossa, 
right inside the um, the cranium it can enter the orbital cavity via the superior orbital fissure right the little crevice or little fissure that we just saw this can compress the optic nerve in the orbital contents as well um, compressing the orbital contents can cause exophthalmus right or bulging of the eyes and think back what we just saw we saw that the superior orbital fissure was right next to um, the optic canal right it was right next to the optic canal where the optic nerve passes through so um, when a tumor is is entering through that superior orbital fissure it's very likely that it's all going to compress the optic nerve um, optic nerve damage can cause um, many different disruptions in vision. So blurred vision, um, decrease in vision, um, it can lead to ultimate neuropathy, which then can cause permanent blindness. If the tumor is in the sphenoidal um, or posterior ethmoid sinuses, then it can erode away at the thin walls of the orbit, um, entering into the orbit as well. Again, this can then compress the optic nerve, um, compress the orbital contents, which then result, results in exophthalmus um, and then visual disturbances as well. All right, so moving on from the orbit, um, the palpebrae are just the eyelids. So the palpebrae or the upper and lower eyelids are there to protect the anterior eye and to moisten the cornea by spreading the lacrimal fluid. Um, the lacrimal fluid, again, is produced from the lacrimal gland at the top and lateral border of the eye. So when we blink, um, the palpebrae or the eyelids are responsible for spreading the tears or the lacrimal fluid in order to moisten the cornea. Um, the palpebrae are covered externally by the skin and internally by a transparent mucous membrane that's called the palpebral conjunctiva. Um, the palpebral conjunctiva, or the lining on the inside of the lids, is reflected onto the eyeball, right, or, or this, a clear layer on the surface of the eyeball that's referred to as the bulbar conjunctiva. The bulbar conjunctiva covers the sclera. Um, the sclera is just the white of the eye. So it covers the sclera or the white of the eye and adheres to the periphery of the cornea. Um, the cornea covers the iris and the pupil, which are like the central portions. So um, the bulbar conjunctiva covers over the white area or the sclera, the sclera but then it, it stops. It does not actually cover the colored area or the pupil. That's where the cornea covers. Um, <clears throat> the bulbar conjunctiva is vascular. There are vessels present, which you can see in the eye, um, and reflections form the superior conjunctival fornix and inferior conjunctival fornix, which are just like the little tiny um, chambers or little little folds or chambers that are present on the top and bottom of your eyes. Okay, so here we see, um, you can see this. So we're talking about the eyelids or the palpebra, right? What you see here and here. Um, the outside is just covered by skin, um, but then you guys see the conjunctiva, this um, mucous membrane covers the inner surfaces of the eyelids and then it folds around to cover the sclera or the whites of the eye. The cornea is the part that covers um, the iris and the lens um, or the iris and the pupil. So the center portion is covered by the cornea. Um, the conjunctiva though lines the insides of the eyelid Right, and it lines the sclera or the whites of the eye. Um, the conjunct, the superior and inferior conjunctival fornix or fornices, um, but 
vortex. Refer to these refer to these little um, like chambers here, these little areas that are formed by the folds of the conjunctiva. And just to kind of get your bearings a little bit over here, um, again, this sclera is like the white of the eye, right, right here. The iris is the colored part. Right, the pupils, the area in the center of the iris. Um, the cornea is the layer that covers the iris and the pupil. This, the conjunctiva covers the sclera, right, up until the cornea, so up until here. Um, <clears throat> the superior and inferior tarsi um, are connective tissues that go in, um, that, are, that are inside the eyelids, and they strengthen the eyelids. They extend into the superior and inferior tarsal muscles. Um, <clears throat> the, the superior and inferior tarsi are deep to fibers of the orbicularis oculi, and they house the tarsal glands. Um, the tarsal glands produce a lipid-rich secretion. Um, and the secretion has a couple of functions. One, it keeps the eyelids from sticking together. And then it also helps to keep the lacrimal fluid from spilling over out of the eyes and onto the cheeks. Um, so it creates kind of a little border that, that repels the fluid, right? Because it's lipidy um, and keeps the fluid on the eye, not spilling out of the eye. Um, of course, there's a limit to this. If you produce too much lacrimation, um, then the excess amounts will spill over onto the cheeks and those are tears. Um, the eyelashes or um, the hairs that extend from the margins of the eyelid and the eyelashes are also associated with glands. Um, these are called ciliary glands and these are sebaceous glands. Okay, so you're looking at the superior eyelid. Um, and just notice a few things. One, the orbicularis oculi muscle right, that circles around the eye. You see relatively um, superficially, but that extends down. And then deep to the orbicularis oculi, um, you can see the tarsus, right? That's this connective tissue that's present right here. Um, and the tarsus does have tarsal glands that make that lipid-rich secretion. Um, if you extend um, posteriorly from that tarsus, you see the superior tarsal muscle. And that superior tarsal muscle, notice that's connecting to, uh, there's another muscle right back behind that, um, and that's the levator palpebrae superioris. Okay, we'll talk more about the function of that a little bit later. So in the medial angle of the eyelids or the palpebrae, so notice that where the palpebrae come together, we have angles, right? A lateral angle and a medial angle. In the medial angle, um, there's this little kind of reddish shallow reservoir of tears that's referred to as the lacrimal lake. In the lacrimal lake, lake the little kind of mound of moist skin is referred to as the lacrimal caruncle. Um, <clears throat> just near like the very border of the eyelid, right near this caruncle, um, there's the lacrimal papilla and lacrimal punctum. So when the eye is, uh, ever the eyelid is everted or kind of pulled back like this, Right here in the corner, you can see the lacrimal papilla is this little like kind of bulge, this little swollen area. And then in it, you see a little hole or a little dot, which is the lacrimal punctum. Okay, so looking here, you can see 
the punctum pretty clearly as the little hole or depression that's present. Um, looking over here again, you can kind of see the whole um, the lacrimal apparatus. You see the lacrimal gland up here. Um, here you can see the lacrimal leg and caruncle, the red in the corner. And you can see the lacrimal punctum, the dot that's present right here. You also see the lacrimal sac and then extending down from that, the nasal lacrimal gland. We'll talk about um, injury to the nerves that supply the eyelids, um, including damage to cranial nerve three and cranial nerve seven. So cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve and lesions or damage to the oculomotor nerve results in paralysis of the levator palpebrae superioris, which I just showed you guys on the last picture. Um, and the muscles responsible for elevating the upper eyelid. Um, so with paralysis of the muscle, it results in ptosis, which is drooping of the upper eyelid. Which you guys can see right here. Paralysis of the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven, um, or sorry, damage to the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven, um, results in paralysis of orbicularis oculi. Um, orbicularis oculi circles around the eye, um, and when it's paralyzed, the lower lid falls away from the eye. So damage to cranial nerve three results in the upper lid drooping. Um, damage to cranial nerve seven results in the lower lid drooping and falling away from the eye. Um, also, the eyelid can't close fully and you lose the pro this protective blinking function um, that we utilize to spread lacrimation across the eye and then also um, whenever anything irritating gets in the eye. So as a result of the loss of this blinking function, um, the cornea tends to dry and get really irritated. Um, that can result in this kind of reflexive excess tear production, um, but it does make the cornea more um, at risk to, to damage because the eye doesn't have that blinking motion when you start to get, to get dust or debris in the eye. Any of the glands in the eyelid can become inflamed um, because there is an infection or because one of the ducts gets blocked. Um, depending on what type of a gland is inflamed, um, this results in either hordeolum um, or telasia. So if the ciliary gland, um, which remember is associated with the eyelashes, um, if the ciliary gland is blocked, this results in the hordeolum, which is also referred to as a sty. This is typically right along the margin of the eye, um, right along the margin of the eye, like right where the eyelashes are. So like what you see right here. Um, and this is a painful, um, red, superative, means that it can be pus producing. But again, red, swollen, and painful. Um, this is typically more tender than um, the chalazia. The chalazia um, is a, an inflammation that occurs from the sebaceous glands um, that are located um, in the tarsus area. So this is normally, like you can see here, it's normally located a little bit further away from the margin of the eyelid. Okay, so we'll talk about um, the lacrimal apparatus for a little while. Um, the lacrimal apparatus refers to all of the structures that um, produce and secrete and distribute and then drain the lacrimal fluid from the eye or the tears from the eye. 
Um, and this all begins in the lacrimal gland, which remember lies in the fossa of the lacrimal gland, which is up in the top lateral aspect of the orbit um, in a little fossa or depression that's present in the frontal bone. Lacrimal ducts convey the fluid from the gland um, into the superior conjunctival fornix. Um, remember the little um, depression that's present um, in the upper eyelid. Then gravity and blinking pull the lacrimal fluid um, inferiorly and medially over the surface of the cornea towards the lacrimal lake, which is on the medial angle of the eye. The tears or lacrimation leave the eye through the lacrimal puncta, that tiny little point that we saw um, on the inner more, more, um, the inner or medial angle of the eye, and through canaliculi into the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac, remember we said, sits in the lacrimal groove on the lacrimal bone. And from there, it drains into the nasal cavity via the nasolacrimal duct. This is why like when you cry, um, your nose gets runny as well, because the fluid drains from the eye into the nasal cavity, and then eventually into the nasopharynx. So here we see all of that. The lacrimal gland is up here in the superior and lateral aspect of the eye. Um, you see the lacrimal ducts that carry the tears or lacrimation um, down into the eye. The um, blinking and gravity will spread the lacrimal fluid across the eye. And then the lacrimal fluid accumulates here in the lacrimal lake which is in the corner of the eye, the medial um, angle of the eye. The lacrimal punctum, or the puncta, is the little tiny dot on the top. And bottom of the eye. From there, um, the fluid drain, drains through the canaliculi. There's a superior lacrimal canaliculus and an inferior lacrimal canaliculus. That drains into the lacrimal sac, which you see right here in the lacrimal groove of the lacrimal bone, and then into the nasolacrimal duct, which empties into the nasal cavity. Okay, so um, we did the orbit and the lacrimal apparatus, and now we're going to move into the eyeball itself. Um, the eyeball is the optical apparatus of the visual system, right? So the eyeball is the, um, the apparatus that actually gives us vision or sight. The eyeball is a spherical structure, um, and all of the parts of the eyeball are either spherical or circular in, nation, in um, nature and it occupies the anterior region of the orbit. The eyeball is suspended by six extrinsic muscles um, that control eye movements and a fascial suspensory apparatus. This suspensory fascia includes the fascial sheath of the eyeball, um, which is referred to as the bulbar fascia posteriorly and the bulbar conjunctiva anteriorly. Um, the bulbar conjunctiva, remember, we just talked about when we talked about um, the conjunctiva, the lining of the interior eyelid and then on the surface of the eye as well. The eyeball is broken up into three layers from the outside in. Those layers are the fibrous layer, the vascular layer, and then the inner layer or retina. The fibrous layer, again, is the outer layer um, that consists of the sclera and the cornea. The vascular layer is the middle layer that consists of the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. And then the inner layer, again, is the retina, which includes both um, visual or optic parts and non-visual parts. Looking over here, you can see these three layers. Okay, this outer layer here that's shown in blue and in white is the fibrous layer. Okay, the sclera is this part that's shown in blue and the cornea is this 
part in the front that's shown in white. The vascular layer is this dark kind of reddish brown layer in the middle. And then the inner layer is shown in yellow here. And this is the retina. The, um, we'll start with the fibrous layer of the eyeball. The fibrous layer is the outermost layer of the eyeball. Um, and the fibrous labor layer really gives strength and shape and resistance to the eye. It's formed of the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is the tough, um, opaque part of the fibrous layer that covers the posterior five sixths of the eyeball. Right, so besides the very front of the eyeball, um, the, the sides and the back are all covered with the sclera. The sclera provides attachment for um, both the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the eye, um, and it's visible through the bulbar conjunctiva as the whites of the eyes. So um, the bulbar conjunctiva is the, the clear layer that covers the whites of the eyes, um, and that's clear so you can see through it to the sclera, or so the whites that you see in the sclera. Um, the sclera has few vessels present. It's not highly vascular, but it does have a few vessels present. The cornea, on the other hand, is completely avascular. Okay? No vessels are present at all. Um, the cornea is the transparent or completely clear um, anterior one-sixth of the eye. Um, the cornea is more convex, right, curved out more than the sclera is, so it does appear to protrude from the eye when it's looked at laterally. Um, the cornea is highly sensitive to touch. It's innervated by the ophthalmic nerve, which is um, cranial fiber, the trigeminal nerve, it's the first branch. Um, because the cornea is avascular, um, it gets nutrients from the nearby capillary beds, and then also um, the diffusic oxygen, for example, diffuses from the tears on the surface and the aqueous humor internally. So the fibrous layer is the outer layer with the sclera and the cornea. Deep to that is the vascular layer, or uvea. Um, the vascular layer has three components that we'll look at. Um, the choroid is the dark reddish brown layer between the sclera and the retina. Um, and this lines most of the sclera. When we look at the choroid, the dense vascular bed um, has larger vessels externally, and then internally it has its smallest vessels. Um, we refer to this as the choriocapillaris, um, and these small internal vessels are what provide oxygen and nutrients to the retina, which is just adjacent to it, um, or the innermost layer that's present, shown in yellow here. Um, the choroid is, is highly vascular, and it actually has the highest perfusion rate per gram out of any tissue in the body. Um, and interestingly, it's the choroid that's actually responsible for red eyes. Like when the flash of a picture, when a picture is taken and the eyes appear red, um, that's actually the vessels on the choroid that are being seen. Um, so the choroid okay, is shown from here, right? It's the red, the red line, but it goes from here all the way around the back, lining the sclera until here. Again, it's just a really dense vascular layer. Um, another part of the vascular layer is the ciliary body. Um, the ciliary body is the, a ring-like thickening of the layer that's just behind the point where the sclera and the cornea meet. So that junction between the sclera and the cornea um, towards the anterior region of the eye um, <clears throat> is um, right near the ciliary body. The ciliary body is vascular, but it's also muscular. Um, and it connects the choroid with the circumference of the iris. It provides attachment for the lens as well. 
we'll see that there are suspensory ligaments They attach um, the lens to the ciliary body. Contraction and relaxation of the circular smooth muscle in the ciliary body controls the thickness and the focus of the lens. Um, <clears throat> so the muscular portion of the ciliary body is important to control how thick the lens is and the thickness of the lens allows us to focus the lens. Ciliary processes on the anterior surface of the ciliary body are responsible for secreting aqueous humor into the anterior segment of the eyeball. This aqueous humor is really important um, pathologically, we'll see when we start to look at glaucoma towards the end of the lecture. All right, so here you can see this area is referred to as the ciliary body. Um, you can see the muscle fibers that are present inside. Um, the ciliary processes are these areas that stick out. Um, that's where the aqueous humor is produced. You can see these um, suspensory ligaments that extend in to suspend the lens. Hey, looking here, um, like the lens is in the center. Uh, you see the ciliary processes forming a circle around, um, and there are suspensory ligaments right, that extend in um, in order to suspend the lens. Um, when there's so the circular muscle goes around, and when the muscle contracts. Um, or relaxes, it adjusts the tension on the lens and that will make the lens thin um, or thick. And again, that's important for focus. The last portion of the vascular layer or uvea is referred to as the iris. This is the most anterior portion of the vascular layer um, and it lies directly on the anterior surface of the lens. Um, the iris acts as a contractile diaphragm um, that covers the lens except for this central aperture or central opening referred to as the pupil. Um, the pupil or the, the opening in the iris is there to transmit light into the eye. And pupil size varies constantly in order to alter the amount of light that we allow to enter into the eye. Um, there are two pupillary muscles that are responsible for controlling the size of the pupil and controlling how much light we allow in. Um, there's a circular muscle and then a radial muscle. The circular muscle, um, the circular sphincter pupillae, and it goes like this, just like a sphincter. And this is under parasympathetic stimulation. Um, when the sphincter pupillae is stimulated with the parasympathetic nervous system, um, it contracts and that constricts the pupil. You can imagine a circular sphincter muscle contracting that makes the pupil smaller, right? Constricts the pupil. This decreases the amount of light that's allowed into the eye. Right? We call this meiosis. Um, and this is an immediate response, right? It's a, it's a very, very quick response. You can watch it happen right before your eyes. There's also um, a radial dilator pupillae, and that muscle radiates out around like that. When this muscle contracts, right, it's like imagine that it, it pulls out on the pupil from all directions, right? It radiates out in all directions. So that opens up the pupil or dilates the pupil. Um, now this muscle contracts due to sympathetic stimulation. And this is actually a much slower response. And this is kind of strange, it's paradoxical um, because normally sympathetic stimulation is fast. 
and the parasympathetic response is relatively slow, right? Rest and digest is just kind of a slow response. Um, so this is the opposite because the parasympathetic response of constriction of the pupil is very rapid. Um, but sympathetic stimulation with dilation of the pupil can actually take quite a bit of time. Um, it can take up to like 20 minutes for the eyes to become accustomed to low light and to fully dilate um, when you're in a low, uh, a poorly lighted area. Um, abnormal sustained dilation of the eyes is referred to as medriasis. Okay, so here you see this. Um, the iris, which is actually um, what you see as the colored part of your eye. So the sclera is like the white of the eye. The iris is what you see as the colored part of the eye. Um, and then the pupil is the open area or the aperture in the iris. So the iris actually consists of two muscles that control the size of the pupil. Um, the sphincter pupillae is the center circular muscle, right? That's under parasympathetic control. And when it's stimulated, it decreases the pupil size, right? Meiosis. Um, <clears throat> the dilator pupillae is this radial muscle that radiates around the outside. That's under sympathetic control. And when that contracts, it increases the size of the pupil, right? And prolonged dilation of the pupil, we said, was medriasis. Okay, so looking at the eyeball itself, the outer layer was the fibrous layer, the middle layer was the vascular layer, and the inner layer is the retina. Um, the retina has two parts, an optic part and then a non-visual part. Um, the optic part of the retina is the part that has, um, has vision receptors, right? It has rods and cones and is sensitive to light rays. Um, there's the neural layer that is the light receptive layer and the pigmented layer that's the single layer of cells that reinforces the light absorbing property of the choroid. So the choroid plexus is this really dark light absorbing area um, that helps to prevent the scattering of light around the eyeball. So the light can all be focused back to the light receptive neural area. So the pigmented layer just kind of helps avoid that fragmentation of light. Um, the optic part of the eye, the neural layers where the actual light receptors are present. The non-visual part of the retina is this anterior continuation of the pigment layer um, that continues along the ciliary body and the iris all the way until the um, edge of the pupil at the anterior aspect of the eye. So the retina is shown in yellow on this picture. Um, just outside of that, you see the choroid shown in this dark red, and then the sclera along the outside. Um, in the front, the sclera continues as the cornea, right? Um, deep to the cornea, you see the iris right, with the pupil out in the middle. Um, deep to the iris and the pupil, you see the lens which is suspended via ligaments from the ciliary body. I think that's everything we've talked about so far. The fundus of the eyeball um, refers to the internal aspect of the posterior eye. So like if you looked straight back in the pupil, you would be in, into the eye, you would be looking back at the fundus, right? On the, the internal aspect of the back of the eye. This is where the light is focused as it comes through the pupil. And this is where the vision receptors are. The optic disc refers to a, um, a distinctive circular area on the fundus where 
nerve fibers and vessels are conveyed into the eye by cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. Um, the vessels and fibers, uh, they enter in via this optic disc, and then you can see very clearly the vessels radiate out from that optic disc. This specific area where the optic disc is, where all of these, um, the fibers and vessels are entering the eye, is a small area that does not have any photoreceptors present at all. So that little area is not sensitive to light. Um, so that's literally the blind spot, right? That's the spot where there's no visual sense um, being perceived at all. We don't see that, we don't notice that because our brain fills in all of the empty spaces for us. Um, but there is a blind spot on the eye or a part where um, we don't we don't perceive any vision. The macula lutea um, literally means yellow spot. Um, this isn't a, a spot or an area that's just lateral to the optic disc. Um, and this is the area where we have special photoreceptor cones that give us our very acute vision. Um, it's called the yellow spot because it actually appears yellow, but this yellow is only apparent when the retina is viewed with red-free light. The fovea centralis um, is a, a little depression um, that's in the center of the macula lutea that has um, the area of our most acute vision. Okay, so we're looking at the retina. Um, okay, so this right here is the optic disc. Okay, this is where the optic nerve enters um, and where you can see the vessels all radiate out from that area. Just lateral to that, this area is the macula lutea. And the little depression, this little dot that you see in the center of it, that's that fovea. That's the area um, where the very most acute vision um, is possible. So the eyeball is broken up into two major compartments, the anterior segment, which is in front of the lens, and the posterior segment, which is behind the lens. Um, the anterior segment in front of the lens is filled with aqueous humor. Um, and this is the area that's important when we talk about glaucoma, the disease process of glaucoma. So the anterior segment or this area in front of the lens is then further broken up into the anterior chamber and posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is the area between the cornea, right, like the outside, and the iris and pupil. And then the posterior chamber, chamber is from the iris and pupil back to the lens. This aqueous humor that fills the whole segment um, is produced back in the posterior chamber, um, but then it goes, it exits through the pupil into the anterior chamber and kind of like flushes around everything. And then it should drain out of the eye, um, right at the area where the iris and cornea meet um, it drains through a trabecular meshwork um, and then eventually through a network of scleral veins. Um, now, there has to be a constant balance of the production of aqueous humor and the draining of aqueous humor. Um, if there's the aqueous humor isn't drained at the same rate that it's produced, it can then build up. Um, intraocular pressure, the pressure in the eye, is a result of this aqueous humor. So if the aqueous humor builds up, um, then intraocular pressure builds up. Um, glaucoma refers to a damage to the optic nerve that occurs typically because of a buildup of aqueous humor, um, which leads to an increase in this intraocular pressure. Um, when the intraocular pressure is increased, this can end up pushing back on the eye and it can compress the retina, um, the retinal arteries, as well as the optic nerve. This can damage the optic nerve and eventually result in blindness. Glaucoma can be described as 
open angle glaucoma um, or closed angle glaucoma, or it's also called angle closure glaucoma or narrow angle glaucoma. Um, open angle glaucoma is the most common glaucoma. Um, in open angle glaucoma, the angle between the iris and cornea, so the angle where the aqueous humor drains from the eye is normal. It's not squished. Um, but somehow the, the meshwork, the trabecular meshwork becomes partially blocked and this slows or interferes with the drainage of aqueous humor from the anterior segment of the eye. So the aqueous humor builds up, intraocular pressure builds up, and then this causes damage on the eye, to the eye. Um, so a lot of times people don't even notice or don't realize that they have open angle glaucoma. Um, and the progression, the damage to the eye progresses really slowly. So frequently people won't even notice that they have symptoms um, until it's progressed pretty far. Um, there are visual disturbances like blind spots that typically will start to appear first, um, but it can lead to complete blindness. Um, closed angle glaucoma is more rare. Um, and with closed angle glaucoma, the lens bulges and that actually squishes um, the angle between the iris and the cornea. So the angle where the where the aqueous humor drains from the eye is actually squished or squeezed, preventing the humor from draining. Again, the aqueous humor builds up, that increases intraocular pressure, and that causes damage to the opt optic nerve. Um, closed angle glaucoma can be acute or chronic. Um, it can be happen, it can be something that happens very, very rapidly, in which case acute closed angle glaucoma is a medical emergency. Okay, so here, this is what is supposed to happen. Okay, again, just in front of this okay, is the anterior segment of the eye. Okay, back here, this is where we make the aqueous humor. Okay, it drains through the pupil, right up here. Um, and then it should leave from the eye right here. So what happens here is you can see this is the angle that we were talking about when we say open angle, closed angle. Um, the aqueous humor should be draining through this trabecular meshwork right here. Right, we produce it back here, the posterior chamber. It comes through the pupil up here, and then it should be draining right here. But if this trabecular meshwork is blocked in some way, um, then it does not drain and it starts to build up. Right, that build up causes pressure, and pressure comes back, it damages the retina and the blood vessels, and then um, the optic nerve. So if you look here, um, this is what it should look like, right? This is normal right here. Um, but if the intraocular pressure increases, right, that starts to protrude back. That pushes this, um, it's called vitreous humor back here in the posterior segment. Um, but that, that pushes this vitre vitre vitreous humor. Um, back and compresses this optic nerve. And you can actually see this um, when visualizing the retina. So this is what the um, optic nerve head should look like. So when you visualize um, the retina, you should see the optic disc. And then within the optic disc, um, there's something called the central cup that's like this really bright area inside. Here, when there's glaucoma, 
um, you'll notice that the central cup, it's called cupping, um, but the central cup gets very large. So now you see this bright area. The bright area is very big um, in comparison to the size of the overall optic disc. Okay, so again, this is healthy. Okay, so optic disc, okay, the central cup is relatively small. This is an increased cup to disc ratio. So um, the, the cup is much larger here. Hey, okay, look how big the cup is compared to the disc. It's almost as big as the disc. Okay, so that's indicative of um, increased intraocular pressure, yeah, as we see with glaucoma. So we said that we have a couple major compartments of the eye. The, um, the front compartment is the anterior segment that's in front of the lens, and the posterior segment is in the back. Um, that's the posterior four-fifths or so of the eye behind the lens. Um, the anterior segment, we said, was filled with aqueous humor. The posterior segment is filled with vitreous humor. Um, this is a watery fluid. The fluid's in like a jelly-like meshwork of the vitreous body, more viscous area. Um, the posterior segment supports the lens, which is just the anterior to it. Um, it transmits light back to the retina, and it also holds the retina in place. Uh, the lens accommodates or changes in thickness in order to allow us to focus on things either um, in a at a distance or things that are closer up. Um, the way that we adjust the thickness of the lens in order to focus is via cranial nerve 3, um, the oculomotor nerve. So um, parasympathetic stimulation via cranial nerve 3 causes contraction of the ciliary muscle. Um, the ciliary muscle, remember, is, forms kind of a ring uh, around the lens. And when the ciliary muscle contracts, the ring becomes smaller and there's less tension pulling on the lens. Um, so when the, the lens isn't being pulled as much, right, it goes kind of slack and it thickens. When the lens thickens, um, this brings up close objects into focus so we can focus on things that are up close to us which is called accommodation uh, the opposite occurs when the ciliary muscle relaxes when the ciliary muscle relaxes it gets bigger right it, it relaxes out like that and that um, stretches the lens Right, or that results in a thin lens. And when the lens is thin, that allows us to focus at a distance on objects that are far away. The lens does tend to change with age. Um, as we age, the lens kind of thickens and flattens. Um, and this does interfere with our ability to accommodate um, or focus on things um, after uh, um, that are up close, sorry, with age. So we call that presbyopia. So after about age 40, it becomes harder to focus on things that are up close. So hence, like, people start to, to hold things far away from them when they're reading them. Um, that's just because of that thickening of the lens. Ophthalmoscopy um, is a way that we use an ophthalmoscope um, in order to visualize the eye, right? To look in through the pupil and view the fundus of the eye. When we look at the fundus of the eye, the pale optic disc is visible um, on the posterior medial side of the eye. Remember, that's the kind of light area where the optic nerve enters the eye and we see vessels that radiate out um, around the retina from that optic disc. 
pulsations of the retinal arteries are typically visible when looking at the fundus of the eye. Um, centrally in the eye, the macula lutea typically appears a little bit darker when appearing um, when, when visualizing the eye normally. Papilledema. Papilledema is a condition um, that refers to a swelling of the optic disc that's visible um, when visualizing the retina. Papilledema occurs because of increased cerebrospinal fluid. Um, when there's increased cerebrospinal fluid, the increased pressure slows venous return from the retina. Um, when there's slowed venous return from the retina, this causes a, a buildup of blood and pressure in the retina that we can actually visualize. So here you can see the difference between a normal retina and the retina when there's papilledema. Um, so here, this is normal, right? You see the optic disc is this light area right here. Um, and then you can see the vessels nice and clean radiating out from that. Um, this is papilledema. You can see literally like the backflow of blood that's built up everywhere. Um, here we see um, what it looks like when there's detachment of the retina. So remember the retina, um, that there are two layers, that pigment cell layer and the neural layer. These two layers aren't firmly attached to each other. Um, so fluid can accumulate between them, causing them to separate. Um, a hard blow to the eye can cause separation, um, again, because of edema and fluid accumulation between the layers. This is resulting in the actual detached retina. Um, this can take a long time to accumulate. Um, this can take days to accumulate. It can take weeks to accumulate, but it typically causes um, kind of worsening visual disturbances, including um, floaters, like kind of little, little fuzzy things floating in your field of vision or flashes of light. Um, both of these are showing you um, what a detached retina looks like. Here you can see the line right here um, and then same thing right here. You can see where the retinas become detached. Um, so there's fluid underneath it. So instead of hugging back like it's supposed to along the posterior aspect of the eye, it's now bulging forward. Um, presbyopia, we mentioned before, but again, this is just um, when the lens loses its focusing power, you, that, that power of accommodation, you're unable, not able to accommodate um, when you're looking at things up close. And again, this happens because of changes to the lens that occur with age. Then the lens tends to, um, to thicken and lose its convexity, um, becomes thick and flat, and it just, it does not accommodate or change in thickness well, so the eye doesn't focus well. Cataracts refer to a loss of transparency of the lens, um, or the lens, instead of being clear and transparent, it ends up looking cloudy, and you can visualize this very easily from the outside. Um, because of this, the light should pass through the lens nicely, but when the lens um, is cloudy, when there are cataracts present, instead the light gets scattered as it passes through the ends, um, through the lens. And this ends up creating blurry vision. So the vision is blurred, just kind of like the eye looks blurred, right, or cloudy. Um, treatment, um, we are actually able to extract the cataracts and replace the lens with a lens implant. Um, there are a couple different types um, of extractions that we can do. Um, extra capsular cataract extraction is when we open up the capsule of the lens and leave that intact and we just remove the cataract. 
and then a synthetic intraocular lens is implanted inside the normal lens capsule um, that was there originally. An intracapsular lens extraction is when you remove the lens in the capsule, right? So you move the whole thing. So the lens in the, um, in the capsule get removed and then there's a synthetic intraocular lens that's implanted in the anterior chamber. So anterior in front of its normal anatomical position, um, the synthetic lens is actually implanted anterior to the iris and the pupil. So typically the lens sits behind the iris and the pupil, um, but we take that out and we implant a new lens in front of the iris and the pupil. Um, these are showing cataracts. Okay, so you can see the cloudiness that's present right there. This is a normal eye. That's the way that the eye is supposed to look. Um, the lens is completely transparent, so you shouldn't see anything from it at all. Like the pupil is just an open spot, right? You should see nothingness. Um, but when the lens is not transparent anymore and it's this kind of cloudy, opaque look, then you can see that's the cataract. Um, the cornea can become um, damaged and ulcerated, um, and we do have the ability to transplant cornea. Uh, damage to the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve V1 interferes with the sensory input from the cornea. Um, without sensory input from the cornea, the cornea is vulnerable to damage and ulceration from foreign particles because particles will get in the eye without you knowing, um, without sensing it. If you don't sense it, you don't produce tears and blink uh, in order to flush the eye so that the cornea can get ulcerated. Um, scarred or opaque corneas can be replaced. Um, we do cornea transplants. Um, from donors, and then, or we can also put in non-reactive plastic implants as well. Okay, so um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the nerves of the orbit. The optic nerves are sensory nerves that transmit visual information from the eye. Um, and again, the optic nerves refer to cranial nerve two. Again, that's just taking purely visual information from the eye to the central nervous system. Um, there are multiple nerves, multiple cranial nerves passing through the superior orbital fissure, um, the opening in the back of the eye, that's located just next to um, the optic canal where the optic nerve comes through. So the nerves that come through the superior orbital fissure um, include cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. Um, these nerves, so three is the oculomotor, four is um, the trochlear nerve, and six is the abducent nerve. These nerves supply the ocular muscles, um, and this, is the, um, it looks like a chemical formula that you can use to remember which nerve innervates which muscle. So it looks better if you write it like, like a chemical formula, like LR6, SO4, AO3. Um, LR is lateral rectus. Um, and lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six, which is the abducent nerve. Um, SO is superior oblique. Which is innervated by cranial nerve four, which is the trochlear nerve. And then AO is for all others. All of the others are innervated by cranial nerve three, which is the oculomotor nerve. 
Um, there are also branches of the ophthalmic nerve that go through in through the orbit. Um, and remember that is cranial nerve V1, or the first branch or the first root of the trigeminal nerve. Here you can see different nerves passing through the orbit. And this is showing you the trigeminal nerve, right? So that's cranial nerve five. Um, and just to show you all of the branches that come through the orbit. Um, so trigeminal nerves, cranial nerve five, this top branch right here, right? That's the ophthalmic branch or the ophthalmic division, right? So that's V1. And you can see all of the branches, right, that end up coming through the orbit. There's a lot. Um, here, you can see the other three um, cranial nerves that are going to the muscles of the orbit or muscles of the eye. Um, again, that's the ocular motor, which is cranial nerve three. You see that there in green. Um, the trochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve four, that's shown here in blue. And then the abducent nerve, which is cranial nerve um, six, that's shown here in purple. Okay, so superior oblique is cranial nerve four. Um, lateral rectus is cranial nerve six. And then the rest of them that you see here are from cranial nerve three, oculomotor, which makes sense, right? Motor, oculo, like moving the eye. Um, learning the arteries of the eye, um, that's one of the things that you guys are going to do during your lab work, but we'll talk through a couple different clinical conditions real quick. Um, blockage of a central retinal artery um, can cause instant and total blindness. Um, and the reason for this is that the terminal branches of the central retinal artery are end arteries. Um, that's it. So obstruction by an embolus completely blocks flow and again results in um, instant and total blindness. This is typically unilateral in the affected side. Um, blockage of a central retinal vein um, usually results in a slow and painless loss of vision. Um, one of the central retinal veins can become blocked because of thrombophlebitis in the cavernous sinus. Um, remember the cavernous sinus inside the skull? Um, thrombophlebitis of the cavernous sinus can allow thrombus to pass back into the central retinal vein, um, and then that will block the central retinal vein. Again, that's a much more slow progression. The artery is instantaneous loss of vision. And there are a couple of reflexes that you guys will um, do when you do a physical exam, the pupillary light reflex and the corneal reflex. Um, these are important parts of a neuro exam when you're checking the integrity of the cranial nerves. Okay, so this will allow you to check the integrity of four different cranial nerves between these two tests. The pupillary light reflex um, is tested by shining a pen light into the eye um, and you do it in you know, one eye at a time. And shining the light into one eye should cause both of the pupils to change. Um, this tests the afferent limb, um, cranial nerve two, right? The sensory limb that's taking the actual light in. And then the efferent limb is cranial nerve three, um, the oculomotor nerve, which controls the, uh, the size of the pupil. Um, when light enters one eye, again, um, both pupils should rapidly constrict. Okay, so when there's a lot of light shining in, the pupil gets smaller to allow less light back into the retina. Um, again, shining it in one eye should cause both to constrict um, equally, and there should be a really rapid response. The first sign of compression of the oculomotor nerve is typically ipsilateral slowness of the pupillary response to light. Okay, so if um, one eye is slow in its 
constriction when you shine the pen light, um, then that's an a important sign that the oculomotor nerve on that same side uh, is possibly compressed. The corneal reflex is when you touch the cornea with a little wisp of cotton. Um, remember the cornea is directly on the front, not just the sclera. Okay, touching the sclera, the white of the eye isn't enough. Um, you touch the cornea. And a positive result to the corneal reflex is for the person to blink. Um, this tests cranial nerve um, V1, so the trigeminal nerve, the first division or ophthalmic division, which brings sensory input from the cornea. And then cranial nerve 7, or the facial nerve, which brings motor input to the orbicularis oculi, which is the muscle that you use to blink. Um, again, you remember to touch the cornea, not just the sclera, and then also that um, if the patient's wearing contacts, that can interfere um, with the reflex. Finally, guys, there are a few um, structures that you guys are responsible for learning on your own and a few things that you guys should um, be able to focus on on your own before the exam next week. Um, one is being able to identify the muscles of the eye, um, the nerves that, I that innervate them, and then the general action. Um, the muscles are listed on page 529 of the textbook in the chart that's there. Um, just also when I say action, general action. Um, so for a lot of the oculomotor, um, or a lot of the... Um, the muscles controlling the eye, just tell me eye movements. You don't need to tell me like medially rotate the eye, raises the eye, abducts the eye, because um, there's a lot of those. So just tell me moves the eye, like that's enough. Moves the eye, raises the eyelid, blinks, like those types of actions are, are plenty. Um, and then also you guys should know the arteries of the eye. That's just simply identifying the artery based on a picture. Um, and those are listed in the chart on page 535 of the textbook. Okay, um, that sums everything up for this next exam. The remaining information um, on the nose and the ear, we're going to um, stop, we'll postpone, and that information I'm going to push forward onto the next exam.